Emily Hofhouse and the concentration camps of the Anglo-Boer War. Although she was a British citizen, Emily Hofhouse was awarded an honorary South African citizenship because of her courageous, sacrificial actions, which exposed the cruelty of the concentration camps during the Anglo-Boer War. Emily was born on 9th of April, 1860, and raised in St. Ive in East Cornwall. That's South Eastern England. Her father was a Church of England pastor for 51 years. Her mother was the daughter of Sir William Pellerawney, a member of Parliament for East Cornwall. And after her mother's death, Emily cared for her father until his death in 1895. Then she traveled to the United States to undertake welfare work amongst the miners in Minnesota. Her engagement to John Carr Jackson was broken off in 1895 and she returned to England. Emily was involved in social action. She is a member of the Women's Industrial Committee. As you can imagine, conditions for workers that say were very um, primitive and there wasn't much in the line of workers' compensation or medical aid or pensions or anything like this. So the workers' industrialists really suffered. As the anglo Boer War broke out in October 1899, Emily joined the South African Conciliation Committee and as secretary, she organized protest meetings against the war. Now you can imagine, it couldn't be very popular in any country to have somebody organizing protests against a war the country's running, especially in Britain, where it's considered every war is a good war and you, it's your patriotic duty to support the government no matter who they're fighting and how they're fighting. In America today, it would be very unpopular to oppose the war, whatever war they're involved in at this time. In summer of 1900, she learned of hundreds of Boer women who had become impoverished and driven away from their homes. And so Emily Hobbas launched the South African Women's and Children's Distress Fund. And she traveled through to South Africa to deliver the aid to the Boer women and children who were suffering because of the war. She arrived in Cape Town 27th of December 1900 and began to live concentration camps in Port Elizabeth, Johannesburg, Bloemfontein, Pochestrom, Novels Ponds, Kronstadt, Arini, elsewhere, even Greenpoint. If you go to Greenpoint Park, do you know there was actually a concentration camp on Greenpoint Park, or what today is Greenpoint Park? And of course, it wasn't much of a park back then. And martial law had been declared over large parts of the Cape Colony, so she needed the permission not only of Lord Milner, but of General Kitchener to visit these camps. Because of her persistence and perseverance, she finally received permission to proceed only as far as Bloemfontein. But Emily described arriving at the concentration camp outside Bloemfontein, 24th of January, 1901. 2,000 people have been dumped on the slope of a copy with inadequate accommodation. Massive overcrowding of 10 to 12 people in a tent, a bell tent. No soap, inadequate water, no beds, no mattresses, scarce fuel. Extremely meager rations. An actual quantity dispensed fell short of the amount prescribed it simply meant enforced famine. And by the way, those whose um, relatives, meaning brothers, husbands, fathers, were fighting were given half rations. All kinds of sickness festered in the camp, including measles, bronchitis, pneumonia, dysentery, and typhoid. This picture of Lizzie van Sail in Bloemfontein, well, this picture is taken by Emily Hobhouse, the daughter of a Boer combatant who refused to surrender, holding the porcelain doll given to her by Emily the girl died at the Bloemfontein concentration camp. And according to Emily, the girl was treated harshly and placed on the lowest rations because it was known that she had a father in the field. Almost every tent housed one or more sick persons. When she requested soap for the inmates, Emily was told by the British authorities, soap is a luxury. As she investigated and interviewed, she wept. She went beyond Bloemfontein to investigate other concentration camps, even though her permit was only to go no further than Bloemfontein. She wasn't about to follow those sort of rules. Um, she took these pictures like Novels Ponds concentration camp, not a tree in sight, just a barren plain. And this is rough in summer. It's hot in summer. It's, it's freezing cold in winter too. I mean, just look at these, I mean, bare tents. And these poor people dumped on the felt like this. Allable North. When informed by the administrator of the Orange River Colony that she showed too much personal sympathy, Emily replied, that was the precise reason why I came out, to show personal sympathy and to render assistance in case of personal afflictions. The report of a visit to the camps of women and children in the Cape and Orange River Colonies by Emily Hobbas was devastating. 
Children were dying at a rate of 50 a day in these overcrowded, unhygienic camps. I call this camp system a wholesale cruelty. To keep these camps going is murder to the children. The women are wonderful. They cry very little and they never complain. The very magnitude of their sufferings, their indignities, their loss and anxiety seems to lift them beyond tears. The nurse, underfed and overworked, coping with some 30 typhoid and other patients, a six-month-old baby gasping its life out on its mother's knee. A girl of 21 lay dying on the stretcher, the mother watching a child of six also dying. Kaspar Johannes Vermeulen of de Wettdorp died at age 12. These pictures all provide by Emily Hompas in a Bloemfontein concentration camp. Already this couple had lost three children in the hospital, like faded flowers thrown away. A splendid child, dwindled to skin and bone. A baby so weak it was past recovery, it was only three months. But such a sweet little thing, it was still alive this morning, when I called in the afternoon they beckoned to me to see the tiny thing laid out. It seemed to me a murdered innocent. An hour or two after another child died. The body of Jarpi Vandenberg outside the tent where he died in Bloemfontein. At Springfontein, a young lady had to be buried in a sack. It is a curious position, hollow and rotten to a heart's core, to have made all over the state a large, uncomfortable community of people whom you call refugees and say you are protecting, but who call themselves prisoners of war, compulsorily detained and detesting your protection. They had signs up in English and Dutch, prisoners of war. Um, you are not allowed outside the limits of the inner camp. Sentries have strict orders to shoot any prisoners passing the inner fence. And they dared to call this in Britain refugee camps where they were protecting these displaced people. Well, they were the ones who burned their farms and forced them there. And then they call them prisoners of war and threaten to shoot them if they pass an inner fence before getting to the outer fence. Those who are suffering most keenly and those who have lost most, either of their children by death or their possessions by fire and sword, such as those reconcentrated women in the camps, have the most conspicuous patience and never express a wish that their men should be the ones to give way. It must be fought out now to a bitter end. It is a very costly business upon which Britain has embarked, and even at such a cost, hardly the barest of necessities can be provided, and no comforts. The Mafeking camp folk were very surprised to hear that English women cared about them and their suffering. It has done them a lot of good to hear that real sympathy is felt for them at home, and so I'm glad I fought my way here, if only for that reason. I call this camp system a wholesale cruelty. To keep these camps going is murder. And Emily provided not just photographs, uh, but also paintings, sketchings, and statistics, po posters. The cry of the children, 5,209 children have died. Now we found since her statistics were inadequate, but on the best of what she had available, this is what she had published. 264 per thousand per annum of all persons, 433 per thousand per annum of children only. So the death rate was so appalling, that means a quarter of the inhabitants of the camps were dying every year. In four years, they'd all be dead, statistically. Almost a half of the children were dying every year. So the average death rate in Britain is about 20 per thousand per annum, but in South Africa, under British concentration camps, it's a quarter for the adults and um, almost a half for the children. And then saying, in two years, all the children in the camps will be dead. And then going... We've already put 200 million pounds into this war, and yet we can't provide soap or enough food for the prisoners. And so um, Emily Harpass uh, documented the burning of farmhouses, the poisoning of wells, slaughtering of herds of cattle and flocks of sheep, destruction of food supplies, incarceration of civilians in concentration camps. If you've seen the Downton Abbey series, I'm sure many of you have, um, of course, Lord Grantham served in the South African war, as did uh, one of his servants. But they never tell you what they did in South Africa. How could they? I mean, who wants to hear about Lord Grantham and so on overseeing the burning of farms or a concentration camp herding of women and children? No wonder they wouldn't talk about it, because I've got a theory, by the way. You know, the Americans keep talking about these post-traumatic stress disorders. Post-traumatic stress is a reality. As someone who served in the army and the fire brigade and has been a missionary for... 42 years to persecute churches, post-traumatic stress is real, but I don't know if disorder is the right word. Uh, despite all the years, and I've traveled with people like Colonel Jan Breitenbach, who was our most combat experienced soldier, more than 50 battles, and stayed, um, we were in sleeping bags next to one another in the field and in barracks for over a month, and I never came across him waking up in his sweats and 
shouting or anything like that. And my theory is this. We all suffer some kind of stress if we've been involved in, in things like emergency services, uh, paramedics, uh, firemen and so on. But we don't have the disorder if we don't have a guilty conscience. I think the reason why the Americans have so many of these people like out of their mind bossies is because they've committed so many atrocities. They're such a propagandized people that, you know, committing atrocities, massacring prisoners of war like was done to the Germans at the end of the Second World War, bombing cities. Yes, I'm sure that your conscience would be screaming, this is wrong. But if you're not willing to admit that what you did was wrong, then you'll have a serious post-traumatic stress disorder. But people who've served honorably, I don't think, experience that. It's normal. You know, if you've been involved in saving lives, rescuing people, and treating your captured enemies well, you're not going to be waking up in a cold sweat and screaming in the middle of the night. I think that happens to people with a bad conscience because they've been involved in, in atrocities, like targeting civilians or murdering captured, civil, captured enemy. So I don't think any British soldier who served in the anglo Boer War could have had a good conscience about this. I mean, what's, what on earth can you justify this for? Burning of homes, farmhouses, destroying farmhouses, burning their wagons, destroying the people's uh, things in their homes, dynamiting homes, destroying foundations, rounding up women and children, putting them into concentration camps. How could anybody not have a guilty conscience about this? But they wouldn't be allowed to speak about it in a negative way because then they're considered a traitor and they could even be tried and imprisoned for that. So the press and everything forced these people to be complicit in an atrocity. And terrible thing, the 20th century began with concentration camps and scorched earth, where historically um, men go to war and the women and children are left alone. But, you know, more and more women and children are the targets of the war, and it began at the beginning of the 20th century in South Africa. And uh, just disgusting, all these orphans, you know, their parents have been killed and now these children are orphans. And was this war even needed? This war was just because the Rothschilds wanted control of the gold mines in Witwatersrand. This is completely um, unjustifiable. Here are the innocents. These pictures, courtesy of Emily Hobhouse. Here's a map of the British concentration camps. You can see mostly on railway lines to make it easy for them to supply and control. Here they documented dynamiting the home of uh, General Louis Boerter, 1901. Church, Dutch Rome Church in Fentersburg burned by the British forces. Another church in Lindley destroyed. Why? Why would you have to destroy churches? And why would you want to reduce to skeletons little children like this? And on the, one of the first successes Emily Hobhouse's campaign was that soap began to be issued amongst the meager rations and conditions began to improve in the camps. Just takes one person to speak up and stand up. Reverend Charles Ackard, a Baptist minister in Liverpool, declared in 1901, Great Britain cannot win the battles without resorting to the last despicable cowardice of the most loathsome cur on earth, the act of striking a brave man's heart through his wife's honour and his child's life. To take the war to the family because you can't beat the soldiers in the field is despicable. This cowardly war has been conducted by methods of barbarism. The concentration camps have been murder camps. The body of Miss Porter of Lady Brunt, 18 years old when she died in Bloemfontein, it was her last wish that her fear, the fear clear be draped around her chest after her death. And these are the pictures that Emily Hobhouse brought back to bring the reality to people in Britain. And the opposition to the war grew as people in Britain realized what the government was doing in their name. Graveyards of children. What avails a man if he gains a whole world but loses his own soul? And in this case, the British Empire gained the world, one-fifth of the world's land surface, ultimately. And uh, yet they'd lost their soul in engaging in such despicable methods. Emily Hoppas wrote, She could not forgive cross male ignorance, helplessness and muddling. I rub as much salt in the sore places in their minds. Emily Hoppas received scathing criticism, as you can imagine and hostility from the British press and government upon her return to Britain. But the opposition leader, Sir Henry Campbell Bellarmine, denounced the methods of barbarism and forced the British government to set up the Fawcett Commission to investigate Emily's claims. And although Emily was not allowed to be part of this commission and she was denied entry 
on her return to Cape Town. They wouldn't let her get off the ship. She had to stay on the ship and go back immediately. They didn't let Emily back into the country in 1902. But her reports continued to circulate, like the, the Camp um, Courant. She moved to France to write the book, The Brunt of the War and Where It Fell, because she wasn't free to do it in England. And she mobilized even more outrage and action. And the Fawcett Commission ultimately confirmed all of Emily Hobhouse's report. She hadn't exaggerated at all, if anything, she had understated. In spite of the fierce opposition from the British newspapers supporting the war, uh, Emily continued to address public meetings about the plight of women and children in South Africa. And she did these watercolors on burned churches, burned farmhouses, concentration camp cemeteries. And there's no doubt that the initiatives and energetic actions of Emily Hobhouse shortened the war and saved countless lives. She also gave hope to the mothers who had lost all hope. Emily Hobhouse's courageous campaign to speak up for the forgotten Boer women and children who had been brutally treated played a major role in undermining the British support for this war. And it also forced the British government to offer massive concessions to the Boers, which led the Boers to regain control over the country through the Union of South Africa in 1910. And the first Prime Ministers of the Union of South Africa were all Boer generals, General Louis Boerter, General Jan Smuts, General James Barry Herzog. But the aftermath of the war was ruined homes, and Emily Hophouse returned to South Africa in 1903 to set up Boer home industries, teaching young women spinning and weaving, and through her efforts, 27 schools were established in the Transvaal and in Orange Free State. She travelled to South Africa again in 1913 for the inauguration of the National Women's Monuments in Bloemfontein, but she had to stop at Beaufort West due to ill health. And here is the Bloemfontein church where Germany Andrew Murray held an inaugural service for the monument, 16th of December, 1913. Mrs. Tibby Smith Stein, the wife of the famous president of the Orange Free State, Martina Stein, she read out Emily Hobhouse's speech. Emily Hobhouse, by the way, was also an avid opponent of the First World War, and she vigorously campaigned against it. And uh, she's done so much to try to inspire the Christmas truce. She called in an open Christmas letter for uh, the guns to be silent, at least on the night that uh, the angels sang. And so she uh, authored a letter to women of Germany and Austria as well, calling them in honor of the Prince of Peace uh, to promote um, an end to violence over Christmas. And Emily said, as in the South African Anglo-Boer War, the brunt of modern war falls upon non-combatants and the conscience of the world cannot bear the sight. Emily Hobhouse's human remains are buried in a niche in National Women's Monument at Bloemfontein. And here her ashes are being bought and buried at the monument in 1926. And here's President Martina Stein's uh, funeral in 1916, General De Wett delivering the speech, and the woman in four trucker costumes at the monument in 1930. It's an inspiring uh, monument. And the southernmost town in eastern Orange Free State is now called Hobhouse. And one of South African Navy submarines was the M SS Emily Hobhouse, which did very famous service during the war in Angola. Um, Emily Hobhouse, I mean, undercover, very appropriate for this person who might have been a bit subversive in Britain, but she was a great champion of human rights in Britain. Again, reminding us, I remember using these four cent stamps myself for some of our mailings in the mission when we got started. Her Boer War letters are published. Um, some of her titles, To Love One's Enemies, That Bloody Woman, The Terminal Life of Emily Hobhouse, Lord Kitchener did not like her. In fact, uh, he said, you know, can somebody not just shoot her? Um, the Compassionate English Woman, another, and there's a film out called That English Woman, well worth getting hold of. Rebel English Woman, The Remarkable Life of Emily Hobhouse. These are just some of the famous films and books. I think 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 is a verse so appropriate for For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So I think she's a great inspiration, one of our chapters and sketches from South African history.